I think it's terrifying. I mean, this seems potentially like one of the biggest stories of my lifetime. And I don't care if it's about UFOs or whatever you call it. Something that we don't understand is getting very close to our military aircraft. The technologies related to energy generation should come out first. This hybrid aircraft is able to basically generate an electromagnetic field. It is uh, President Trump's belief that the United States must remain as dominant in space as we are on land and sea here. And your charge is to see to that mission with the United States I mean, There were three people on my team assassinated, and I was almost killed. With a lot of people like to know what's going on. It's a matter of national security. But apparently, just recovered, are off-world vehicles not made on this earth. The president will respond to the subject the way they want them to. There's a black box with all the technologies that would give us a civilization that's sustainable, peaceful, etc., and it's been around for decades. Everybody's asking the biggest question in the world. Are we... Look, it's holding... It's just out there. The narrative that's being launched, which is a false narrative, is that we're not alone and that those civilizations are a threat. The problem is, is that the public has to be informed and involved. Uh, it could be a brief statement saying, hallelujah, you know, I'm finally vindicated. I don't, I, I'm not completely convinced they're going to let this stay like it is. But the people who are surrounding that level of, of our politicians and government are not told like the movie Independence Day, where we'll say, let's go kick alien butt. Good evening and welcome to Dark Hour Paranormal. I am your host, Michael Roser. And this evening, folks, <laughs> once again, I have a treat for you. Uh, and I do not say this lightly. My guest this evening is Jared Murphy, the author of It's Not Aliens, Worse, It's Us, Discovering Our Lost History. And believe me, he does not confine himself to one particular aspect of this field that we all know and love. He is spread out far and wide like the largest ocean that you can imagine in terms of his information, his research, his intellect, his wisdom, and everything that he has to impart upon us in the way of reaching a new state of being. I am very excited, folks, to have Jared with me tonight. And before we get started, let's, uh, let's, let's learn a little bit about Jared here. So uh, let me put it this way. I'm going to read a, a short bio and we're going to jump right into the interview because uh, I don't want to, again, waste a moment time because it's going to fly by. I promise you, uh, Jared Murphy, uh, the evidence from historical record legends and myths are shouting that it wasn't aliens, that the advanced technologies are echoes of a human society. We do not have a written record of. We have the rem remnants of their buildings genes and the sciences that point to a highly advanced human race that survived multiple catastrophes and to this day may live among us human bones have been found back millions of years alongside the homo erectus and other primitive humans many revelations of high technology have been uncovered by independent researchers all over the earth anomalies in the historical record out of place out of time artifacts are labeled as mysteries or one-offs yet show signs of advanced sciences and intelligence ancient maps showing lands that were not supposed to have been known let alone covered deep in ice for thousands of years before human civilization the case is evaporating 
the timeline given for modern man being here only three or four hundred thousand years. Taking the reader through many fast advances recently in technology and looking at archaeological evidence, we build a case for that lost society and technologies. Looking further at rediscoveries of the world of movement, fitness, discoveries in eating and superhuman abilities, and finds in our very own genes that without a doubt show us that we have highly advanced ancient relatives. Amazingly illustrated, this book with over 200 photos takes you on one incredible journey. And that does, again, doesn't really speak volumes for the man behind the literature. And I think we're going to raise that veil a little bit tonight, just a peek, because again, some of these folks that I have the uh, pleasure and opportunity to talk to have a wealth and lifetime of information and knowledge behind them. And it would take more than one and a half hours <laughs> to even get through a, a very minuscule amount of it. So that being said, without further ado, folks, I'm going to bring on Jared Murphy to Dark Hour Paranormal. Hey, Jared, how are you tonight? Thank you for joining us here. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to be uh, throwing some questions at you. Some of this centered around your book and what you've put out. I'm going to switch this up here. Uh, and some of it is more along the lines of esotericism and so forth. So let me start with something that's a little off the topic that I think we're going to be going on to. And I want to talk to you for a moment here about cellular memory. Okay, so there's been a lot of debate, and I think we've even touched upon it in our own conversations, that, you know, people might be remembering past lives and attributing certain experiences and, again, memories and anchoring them here as an identity, okay, of that past life, and they bring it into this character as well. Uh, but at what point do we draw the line between remembering a past life and recalling what we know as cellular memory? Well, there, there's a quick question to start us off with. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I'm definitely guessing that most of the listeners and everybody that's on this show has, ha has some uh, dive in on this subject. And it's such a broad one. And what's the short answer is uh, we don't have a line yet. We don't know those lines. I, I, I have prescribed that we are essentially in safe mode uh, individually and as a planet that what we once terraformed and managed holistically is now so broken that, you know, you can pretty much walk over carpet and get static electricity. So the concept of a collective human consciousness and that of an individual memory and that of what we would, uh, you know, we talked about a little earlier prior to the show was vibrational medicine. And the whole subject of that includes the idea that there's uh, like an aura around us. that's not a woo woo aurora. It's actually a Karelian photo that can be taken that shows a magnetic field. And we've duplicated this research uh, right down to some cellular genetic stuff that, uh, uh, Burr did in 1940 at Yale. And the, the concept was, are the magnetic lines that flow, what they were able to, what he was able to establish even as 1940 goes, was that no genetic development needed to be done, that using salamanders in this case, that the magnetic lines that identified the salamander as a salamander existed in an unfertilized egg. And what that means is, is that what we are shaped out to be seems to be pre-existing. But the question is, is it a random natural occurrence or is it something that is designed? And we have to look to different technologies that we find in our past to then tie into that idea that there that this collective consciousness where sometimes we have an intuition is that a stored genetic memory is it we've we've shown in worms now at least at our level of understanding we've shown in worms that uh, uh if we give the mom a traumatic experience without details the, the reality is that we have now been able to prove that there is a genetic marker that lets the baby worm know uh this is a bad thing just like, why do we all want to go up the staircase from the basement faster? Uh, that kind of thing. And why? Wh wh what we haven't been able to do is say, okay, what is the line between uh, 
I again, people always remembering that they were Cleopatra, but they were never Bill the Elephant Scooper at the ancient zoo. You know, ironically, there are people who do. I make that joke, but there are people who say, you know, I wasn't anybody important, but I remember being on a farm. I remember being in this one place. And then, yeah, there's been a lot of activity on this planet we don't know about, but it is highly. Uh, the odds start reducing when somebody recalls a normal life, they go to a location and that uh, past life may have not been there for a thousand or 2000 or 3000 years. And they find a farm. I mean, those things do happen. So it's not like everyone's always Caesar or, you know, somebody famous. However, when we tap into these memories and what we know about of, and vibrational medicine has to include the quantum world. You know, there's not a separation between science and nature. Right now, that's a really unnerving thing for people to consider that what you identify when you go out in the woods and you go for a hike or you go running, you go climbing, you're not possibly looking at what you think is random natural environment. It's not there's some book somebody's going to find one day and go, oh, here's the manual for the planet. We're still supposed to have 60 billion mosquitoes and 10,000 woolly mammoths. Well, we screwed it up. <laughs> we, we make this automatic assumption that there's this lineal path to where we are today and that, oh, well, it was all random. And that that's based on some theories that we've had taught to us. But it's not the reality of when we're experiencing what some people call paranormal, what some people call past life, uh, what we've identified in certain religions as uh, rebirth or uh, just, uh, you know, you're coming in for your next life. And it's described that way. But what we do know, at least even from 2008 now, is that they were able to take genes at Harvard and take a 50,000 word book and print it into the human genome. And then they kept piling in data. So this means you and I talk, you and I live, but our genes themselves right now, it's scary. The hubris in that we have a genome structure where they say already they're like, well, we've identified six or 7,000 junk genes. Mm -hmm. They're junk genes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's terrifying. You have no idea if those genes are actually part of collective ones and zeros and bits where we've gone from 2008 where we're storing a single book on a little bit of uh, DNA to being able to store a terabyte of data on about a gram of DNA. And that doesn't mean the DNA is tied up all the way back to 1940 when, well, you know, a sperm and a an egg have to marry and there's going to be an unpacking of information. It's going to become a human being. Uh, as early as 1940, they're identifying the very structure that's going to be whatever being, whether it's a salamander or a human, they already identified that there's already a magnetic existence uh, and a, a definition of what that is already. Where is that programming come from? We could just dive into that for a long time. And now we have people who are saying, look, I was this person. I was this thing. I could taste it, smell it, feel it. I was there. Were you? Or are you able to tap into the network? Because depending on what you eat and how you work out and what, you know, some people would say ayahuasca or, or some sort of external jumpstart where we are now in safe mode. So without even touching that, the idea that we are in a mode where we occasionally like come to consciousness to a technical ability that we are now identifying as a spiritual one or a paranormal one that is definitely because of your wherever you're at car x pick it up brain injury there's some crazy things that happen why does some you know the, the gifts that are described why does somebody wake up and suddenly they speak french and they've never spoken french mm -hmm, right or you know so is it a rattling of that genetic memory those six thousand seven thousand junk genes are really tied to this collective human consciousness that's tied through this aura that's a, a magnetic wave frequency system that is not described medically or technically currently and is it combined with passed down not just an instinct like if you step on the fire and the coals it's going to be hot you should do that nothing that simple more complex that you're remembering a collective story and it's only because we have so many people on the planet that we're possibly more quickly awakening right now we think that mm -hmm. the person in the jungle or uh in a in a desert or these uh, 150 plus tribes that we leave alone around the world we think oh well they live really simply they're not contributing to uh 
an invention of a rocket ship or a Tesla. They're not in, they're not doing anything with laptops or medicine, but I always use Leonardo da Vinci as an example. He collectively with what, what we thought was maybe a half a billion people on the planet. He thought of a plane, but it was a corkscrew and it was made out of wood. It wasn't, he's thinking of graphene conductors for spintronics and, and a, a simple criticism could be that, well, as you learn things, as you learn things, you uh, then can apply off the fundamental basis of all that foundational knowledge. You can add just onto it. And so the next step of a, of a regular computer must be a quantum computer. But I don't think it's that simple. The mm. other activities, like I'm a big practitioner of Wim Hof, and the idea is to be able to activate your inflammatory response uh, to reduce it or to control it, or also your heat and cooling when you're in cold weather. But there's also a breathing technique, and it really is like a switch. It, it puts you into a presence that is not something you have to think yourself into. It's definitely something going on. But are all these abilities from uh, paleo and movement world, are all the abilities we're rediscovering due to the fact that it's just we've built on random mistakes and we haven't had a big enough disaster? Or is that we have 8 billion people with a collective human consciousness ram that makes the one person think of that nanotechnology, that rocket ship. And I think it's incredibly important to consider all that when people right now have an easy sense that devaluing lives is an okay thing. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think that's incredibly important. It's cliche to say every life matters, but I, I think that there are people out there who have been quoted as saying that, you know, we could do without a certain percentage of the population or that they don't contribute. Now there are behaviors of people that I think, you know, should stop. I don't think we live in the middle ages. I don't think you should burn people at the stake or accuse people of being witches or care who they marry. But I mean, there's that, but collectively the value is we've been able to reach, I think far beyond our current imagination, not just in ideology or poetry or in storytelling, uh, whether it's through any medium that we have, but in this, uh, actual awakening of our internal control systems mm. to, to reduce that inflammatory response, to manipulate our hot or cold, to be conscious that it's not a superpower, it's just something we could all do and we forgot, but we mystified it. You know, it sat in a temple with monks for thousands mm -hmm. of years. You know, and instead that, of, yeah, so the Tibetan uh, Tomo or Tumo, I'm not Tibetan, so I'm not going to say it right. For, oh, I apologize for everyone. But again, you have monks. Uh, sitting in a secret temple in a secret place and protecting the secret method of sitting there with a frozen blanket on their shoulders in 20 below zero, just like the Iceman Wim Hof is running barefoot with shorts and no shirt 20 below for 26 miles multiple times and climbing Mount Everest. Here you have these monks doing it, but here's the difference. They do it secret in a temple. Wim Hof brought what he does to everyone. Stieg Severinsen, breathology, bringing it to everyone, setting not just, oh yeah, it's cool. I, I can, you know, it's like, okay, it's cool to not breathe, but be able to function. Uh, that's, that's cool to, you know, like uh, Stieg set a world record. You can watch it time-lapse on, uh, on some internet uh, videos of him sitting on one breath for 22 minutes, but he's not uncomfortable. He's not doing it just as a parlor trick like a magician did recently before that and right. suffered. Right. Uh, yeah. And, and, and so reactivating these abilities rather than tolerating uh, inconveniences are two different paradigm shifts. And so there's a lot to do with this genetic side to it because people are tapping into it. And it's not that, oh, well, we have more technology and we can share these stories. No, I think more and more people are tapping into it. We have to always step back and look at a 50,000 foot view and say, okay, uh, more people on the planet, more human energy, more human connectivity, more collective consciousness, more hundredth monkey, if you want to call it that. And then here we are with uh, these awakenings, which is causing other people to awaken, which then they're tapping in and they're saying, I used to, I have this memory of being this person. I have this memory. And it's like, and, and therein lies the question for those out there that experience this consider, is this something that you try to write it out? Right. Everyone wants mm -hmm. to sit in deja vu and go, what am I feeling? Like how, like what's going to happen next? Or why do I think I've been here? And, and then like, Again, a lot of people like to jump into interdimensional or multi. It is literally easier 
for everyone to believe in it, it okay it's a it's a scientific thing to say are there other dimensions is there a multiverse that's a scientific question but people feel it's easier to accept and dialogue in the last i think 20 30 50 years it's easier to dialogue uh, interdimensional space traveling aliens that is an easier dialogue and the paranormal the idea that then the idea that ancient advanced humans terraformed the planet with ancient engineered soil they were able to connect and use the planet itself as an earth grid they tuned it they fine-tuned it they developed plants animals the, uh, they were connected they were using an energy grid like nothing we were using and something went wrong something fell and these aliens or ufos that everybody keeps seeing and going i'm telling you they're from another again if you describe to me one more time what is essentially the plot of deep space nine or babylon five i'm gonna bang my head on a wall <laughs> I, I i love you but if you're hearing what sounds like stargate you're talking about stargate and yeah, we we want we want to use a vernacular that we all understand, and we all use movies. I mean, I'm the first person to use Raiders of the Lost Ark. I mean, who didn't want to do that. I wanted to find golden monkeys. I did not want to get all worked up about. Hey, did you realize that all over the planet there's terraformed, engineered ancient soil that's the greatest growing soil on Earth. Uh, no one knows how to make it. We've created modern bio biochars, but they don't have piezoelectric properties. They don't filter heavy metals and carbon dioxide. There's something we all want right now, right? That whole, we, we think we need to deal with carbon dioxide. Well, from Siberia to North America to Canada, when I say North America, I mean from Canada all the way down to Brazil and further to Australia, there is human advanced engineered soil that is ancient. And it's in places that we're all supposed to be nomadic, just like Gobekli Tepe. So here we are with a connective system where back to genetics, it ties in because some people easily communicate well with, they call them horse whisperers. They communicate with animals. They communicate and we think, oh, it's just a really good intuition. It's a really nice empathy. And yet we have stories in mythologies and in biblical teachings, we have people talking to animals and then everything happens like the younger dries or the great flood. And suddenly it's like, nah, it's a free for all eat everybody, you know, but here's this legend story of, well, we talked to animals. We didn't eat them. They were part of this grid, this network, mm -hmm. if you want to call it. And, yeah. So, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, let me let me jump in here real quick because you are going into some topics that, my God, I would love to discuss at length with you. But yeah. um, I want to bring it into the archaeological end and what you're mentioning, the ancient civilizations and cultures that were here uh, before us. Now, that being said, why do you think there's such a hesitation for people to accept there may have been civilizations outside of our current understanding of humanity's timeline? To me, that's it's just, you know, we haven't discovered that yet. Or if it, if it doesn't fit within what we have, why... Yeah can't we entertain the possibility of something outside of what we know? I mean, there's a whole teenage social structure and adult uh, keeping up with the Joneses based on, I have the latest uh, phone. I have the latest car. Yet, bizarrely in academia, standard, stuffy, Victorian academia in its roots is holding on to here is our dinosaur theories, which uh, are, okay, first off, they're theories. All theories should be proven. Every attempt to prove how polygonal masonry is made, how let, all you got to do is take a stone cutter, Christopher Dunn, the engineer, or any engineer, anyone who works with manufacturing and fabrication, anyone I've done historical restoration remodeling, including structural changes for almost 20 years. And when you look at these constructions and say, yeah, they started out with giant 800 ton, 1000 ton, 3000 ton down to uh, 50 ton or 10 ton or handhold, but they've been able to cut 20 different ways from Sunday, use no mortar, calculate that this building at this height, uh, based on its distance from what we know of uh, tectonic plate shifting, uh, we know that if we build a building with these cuts everywhere, and bring the stone, by the way, from either two miles south uh, of the height we're at and 75 miles to 1,000 miles away uh, with, it, with, with, of course, weirdly, the highest crystalline contents and the most very computer-looking contents, very flash-drivey-looking. We're going to build with these, 
and we're going to account for earthquake shifting and frequency technology stuff, yet we're going to finish it off with river rock at the top and say the Aztecs built that and the Egyptians built that. Those are all dynastic peoples. And so the problem is, for whatever reason, uh, mainstream academia chose, unlike every other field, like we like the classical books, but we like to new, read new authors. We like to read new stories. We like to retell them in movies and in, and even on the radio. We, we do live theater with this. We modernize even the classics and operas. We uh, make interpretations, arrangements, just like composers. We don't just stick with a single arrangement. There are subtle shifts that we choose to entertain ourselves with. However, in the world of academia, this is what it works. This is uh, this is weirdly how we, maybe as Westerners, envision the world. Uh, there was the Fertile Crescent, there was the Garden of Eden, and then for all those who are naysayers, well, everything's out of Africa. And we've developed theories around that, and they're very solid theories, and we, we table all the facts to those theories. We don't table any facts that don't. And we have account after account. Thank God for Michael Cremo and Forbidden Archaeology among oh, just one book of almost a thousand pages that should be on everyone's shelf. Just re-representing paleoanthropological finds. The minute we decided to take archaeology seriously, we were finding human bones, uh, Eolith, not just eolus and neolus, which are really simple stone tools that represent the loincloth people that you're going to find in every museum. And if you Google Go Back Le Tepe, they build giant, sharp, megalithic stone pillars, but they use all their time for hunting, gathering, and wearing loincloths. So then they finish off the entire structure with lean to. On a structure we didn't know existed, we've only dug up 5% of it. So the constant pull, it's been well-established for 100-something, 150, 200 years that we came out of Africa, either the Garden of Eden or out of Africa. We can marry those two ideas. And then came the Greeks, then came the Romans, then came the Dark Ages, and then came us. Oh, something happened in China. Something happened in India, but that, that doesn't matter. So despite there being 200 pyramids plus in China itself, Angkor Wat showing polygonal construction. Easter Island has polygonal construction. Forget the big giant Moai. 150 of the oldest Moai are basalt. They're very finely polished, but the, the younger ones are very simple or they're simpler made. Just like everywhere you find, dynastic people come and they take over a site and it blurs the lines. And to sort out what's really happened is yet another show. It's another one of those, it would be very hard. Nobody wants to admit they're wrong, but that's not the point. In every field, I believe we need to pay archaeologists to literally not find. They need to have guaranteed money to do their, uh, to, to do any type of field work. An archaeologist needs to be able to be free to find what they find, not find facts. I've talked to too many archaeologists. I've talked to too many uh, people who have witnessed, uh, you know, finding something that doesn't fit the narrative for what the sponsorship is for, for that find, and choosing only to table facts that fit the theories. And I don't see any other industry that has a death hold on such archaic ideas. It's hmm. just astounding, and it's on. I, 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 we could spend a lifetime arguing with these people, and thank God, I think we're in a renaissance finally of not only thinkers like ourselves and the the like you said the esoteric, the the meditations that are actually triggering real energy experiences, but we have and and the the even the way chiropractors, the way everyone's incorporating uh, this. Even even though I call it the blinky board, and they're banging on it, and it's it's orange on the left side, it's red on the right on the right side. They've been doing it for a thousand years, and then uh, somebody walks up and says, "That is a seven forty seven, and why are you banging on the control panel?" And then they say, "Heretic," and it's the blinky board. We do the ritual, and it, and we have a response, and the response is orange. Yeah, no, it's a plane. It flies, but they don't see it as that. So I think a lot of the technologies that we tap into through our metaphysical work through what we what we understand of sounds, vibrations, meditations, chantings. It's the frequencies and the tonalities, but we have so much mysticism in our post-flood mythologies that we have blurred that we're getting a response. And sometimes it's even the right response to the technology, or we're just edging into like the awareness and the conscious, like tapping into that collective consciousness, having a group experience, but it's not 
the actual like we're not there in the mm -hmm. technological we don't understand why is it blinking orange or red those are just two buttons it turns out we have a very sophisticated engineered system that is very broken and so it's the combination of us tabling all these different facts and just not referencing them from what we already know it's just looking at what we have and saying man this is not what we thought it was it's not what we're experiencing and it is literally i think a renaissance it's just not what people expected i think to find and for a lot of mm -hmm. people that i think it just clashes with either you know they spend a lot of money and a lot of time working on a particular degree you know they're very fascinated by there's so many interesting things about humanity and i am sure the heck not taking a, a dash at anyone who's interested in any particular tribe or culture every human life i know it sounds cliche but every human life is incredibly valuable and every human experience has been part of this grid and this network which isn't just our planet it does mm -hmm. connect out existentially through you know our solar system galaxy and beyond we are not just an isolated uh either as an individual or as a culture and a society today from our past and our future and that's where you could start playing with that interdimensional inter you know multiverse multiple decision sort of you know well, you tie in you bring up a good point when it comes to archaeology and some of these other practices that we're familiar with uh, on the academic uh, side of things. At what point in the history of archaeology, I'll just pick on for the moment here, did we lose the passion to understand and interpret different theories wherein suppression and silence have since commandeered? Uh, it really does seem like today there are only a, a few brave souls who dare to kind of step out of this box and really report not only what they're finding at face value, but then giving their interpretation, no matter how left field. So again, uh, where did we lose that right direction in the field of archaeology? I think I, I don't want to pin it on Darwin, because even when Darwin wrote what he did, even by the 1850s, nobody said Darwin was right. It was one more, it was one more theory. And so nobody was really jumping on that. And the father of South American archaeology, who I quote in my book, a couple different of his lectures and presentations, that, you know, he, this is an archaeologist who is considered the father of South American archaeology, who's discussing, uh, hey, we know that the Chinese came to South America. This is over 100 years ago. And they knew the Chinese came to South America. We know that there's Roman galleons off of the Brazilian coast, at least the Brazilian coast. We know these things. And they're mentioned even by these early paleoanthropologists and archaeologists. So there wasn't, there was still kind of a free for all. There was free thinking. Uh, you had people finding things at Table Mountain in uh, California during the gold rush that definitely showed human remains in situ, not not an intrusive burial definitely at a layer of slate that was intact you have the red crag you have places in the mediterranean and what it shows from the beginning was people were saying well this looks like it was 20 million years old this looks like it was five million years old and nobody and they're like well right away uh there were people though that said well that's not possible and i'm not trying to be a bad guy about christianity but in the western world the the people who take the Bible literally say, well, everything started 10,000 years ago. Well, you can't have uh, human remains that are 5 million years old. You couldn't go to a college campus where there wasn't a church. There isn't. There are many, even state universities. There are religious buildings that relate to mostly Christianity that were established as part of the learning system. And so... You can't have people, even in the 1800s, saying, well, I just found a whole human skeleton, or at least most of the remains, and they're in situ, and they have not been disturbed, and it's definitely not a burial, and this one's 20 million, this one's 60 million, this one's, you know, this is 5 million. You can't have that. So right away, I will, I will just say that that's something to look into. It's very interesting because there is this naysay on that side. But then on and then on the other side, is it the only driver? Well, people don't like to be wrong. People don't like to look wrong. So now you table up a bunch of facts 
but here's the thing they're not related facts but you've tied them to the theory you've tabled a bunch of facts and puzzle pieces that don't actually fit together but you'd said that they did mm. so they've been just spreading out the pieces and filling in the middle and saying all the facts that represent these pieces are the facts that represent that definitely go on, on top of the theory that we have painted underneath this table and we're eventually going to find all the puzzle pieces that will fill in where we have currently filled it with nothing but bs uh, but just don't look over there. Just look over here. And so I think that Trust it was them. pretty muted by the time we were, well, I would say that we were well on track with, now we have established museums in modern times. So I would say if you jump, remember right away, archaeology wasn't archaeology. It was, hey, I found a really cool Roman statue and I want that in my castle. I want that in my villa. Through the dark ages, archaeology was all about finding cool stuff and gold <laughs> and jewels, but it wasn't for you to put it in a museum. It was for you to wear it and sell it. It wasn't for you to preserve history or knowledge or anything. And so what's happened is, is that we've now switched and we want to preserve our past and our understandings of it. However, we've gone down some roads and we can historically go down and look at who burned whose culture and when, and mm -hmm. how much is at the Vatican Library or at any collegiate institution that has been buried in drawers, is that whose history is that? That's our history. That's Those are our stored genetic memories. Somebody watching casually and listening to this or watching a show and is looking away at ancient origins or pick the site and say, gosh, that site looks familiar. I, I can't tell you how many people I talk to that go to a stone circle or like a henge or go to Egypt. Uh, I was talking to Scotty Allen Roberts and it's and the experience he had while he was there. There was a genetic memory or something triggered more than once at different locations. So if you have a huge human population that's interconnected by the very soil itself, just like the Nazca lines, these giant earth grids, there's also, they call them the, the Bolivian Nazca lines. They're in Jordan. They're all over the world. These giant integrated grid-like patterns, not the monkeys and the birds and the drawings that have been graffitied on it. I'm talking about the straight lines that run for 25 kilometers that are unbending, but perfectly shaped that appears the system was part of an antenna or a broadcast array. But these are this is an entire system that's now broken down and we can keep breaking down the technology and the, and the ancient aspects of it, but I'm digressing. I apologize. <laughs> no, no, not at all. This is uh, this is why I was so excited to have you on because, uh, you know, it's it's one thing for somebody to take a question and go here and here and here and here, but you do that, but then you come back around, you add something more to it than what thank was initially you. imposed. Yeah, dude. No, thank you. Is really what it I, should be. Um, well, I, I don't want to be <laughs> accused of like you never come back. I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure I come back. I think no, I come back. you do. You do tie it in because I'm listening very intently. And uh, no, I, I very much enjoy the way that you're bringing these things together. Uh, I have a couple questions here. I'm going to throw at you, uh, obviously, one at a time before I, I <laughs> bring out the one big question that everybody wants to know uh, your opinion on. And all right, so the, the first question I want to ask you here is, in your opinion, at going on the more esoteric tip with what, you know, some of these ancient religion, I'm sorry, civilizations may have practiced, uh, in your opinion, was it a natural course for earlier civilizations to explore ontology than perhaps our modern cultures that subscribe to a more left brain interpretation of reality? I have thought on this for a really long time. Um, I'm not decided. And I'll Ooh. tell you where I, I had some ups and downs, but I won't give you the journey. This is where I'm at with it. I I had a huge impact made on me when I read Ray Kurzweil's The Singularity is Near. And even though it's 2008, it's very relevant. It goes into nanotechnology. And I think what's relevant is we think of technology as we're going to create a, a mechanical creature or at, even now we're just starting to unlock viruses. Viruses are just keys. They're essentially programs. And so are other natural things that we describe as natural. And I, I think that in looking at the technology of our highly ancient advanced ancestors and the, the short answer I can give is somewhere between definitely 50,000 years ago back to the oldest known objects found that appear man-made, which are the Klerkstorp spheres in South America, which are two and a half-ish to three and a half billion years old. That's B, billion. And mm -hmm. these are not natural concretions. So somewhere in that time frame, we have at least one 
a worldwide population that is well connected that we think of this external technology and I, I want us to dive into the idea that or not accept but just table the idea that genetic technology means that right now we create a designer baby or we clone a sheep which we're way past that now we're creating designer babies people should mm -hmm. really think about that and we have 3d printers that print hearts and lungs and ears yep and, and we even have tools that you could just hold handheld 3d printers that can work into a wound and so our limits of how we think of uh a cell uh programming that cell rejuvenating it and manipulating it is from a more a still a mechanical world where these people are dealing with biology itself they are actually programming and commanding uh the necessity the necessities uh, from a science down to uh, what might be to us look like Merlin the Magician saying, let there be a rabbit, and then there's a rabbit. But it's really uh, just a nano program, and it's not programming atoms of nothing. It's creating uh, genetic modules that develop a rabbit, but do it quickly and do it in front of us. And we think, you know, we, they snapped a finger and it's a magical rabbit. So what does that do to your religion? You know, what does that do mm. with your uh, ideas of, you know, what are you, if you think you yourself, it, see, here's the problem. We are all having, including me having this conversation at 10 to 15% consciousness, which is all we can do. This is it. We have to just have this dialogue and we have to try to work it out. So what do we do? Uh, if we have 80 or 90 or 100% consciousness, we have full abilities like synesthesia, which I, I should describe to everybody, but I won't, to stick with the idea of, and I bring up Ray Kurzweil's novels. Uh, it, well, it's nonfiction. And what it is, is if you could replace every cell in your body with nanobots and what actually gives you consciousness, what defines where in your body is consciousness when we know every cell in your body within a year is completely cycled and new. So you and I are not literally, if we meet each other in six months, going to be, we might be a third or not at all who you and I are today. Mm -hmm. Every cell in our body is going to be different. And that's super trippy, uh, except uh, what, what does it do? Uh, what are your connectivities then? If you can do quantum computing, let's jump way ahead. You can literally think person to person. You're using your pineal gland. You're connected to the earth. You're tasting, touching, and sensing the play that you're watching because you're literally connected through abilities like synesthesia. And you're, you're you, you know, you don't need a cell phone. You're just there. But what does that do? Again, the assumption is when we have radio signals that come to the earth, we think those are foreign. If you've already been here in highly advanced, you've already sent out satellites and we can grow bricks. So when we think of technology, we think, well, it wouldn't look like an asteroid. It could easily look like an asteroid because if we can grow bricks, uh, we want something hardy that is interconnected, redundant, like a flash drive that can solar, uh, uh, you know, recreate itself. But, it, you know, the idea that we would have expanded out beyond not just the moon, but to Mars or other within the solar system that we would have expanded out to moons that we would have already occupied this solar system. That's very much a possibility. So as this society, just to paint a picture of what do you do with faith? What do you do with religion? What do you do with, which is interesting because on a biblical level, a lot of people think that uh, some people who don't read their Bibles uh, who are, well, they, you know, they're religious. They believe in, uh, you know, that, that, well, the, the stereotype is Hollywood's white robe on a cloud, but the revelation says it's a renewed or restored earth. And I'm not trying to be a Bible expert. I'm not trying to go there, but it's a good example that what's going to happen. The reason why is that in the myth? Why is that in the mythos? Why is it that the, that, that it's going to be a restored earth? Because I think at some point we know and did have an earth that was fully terraformed and functioned, but that's the highest and best uh, that's offered. And then, of course, the idea, the entity, the idea of a God entity, which until our modern times was a duality. There was a goddess mm -hmm. and God. And we've really messed with what that is. And I think that if you were 100% conscious and collectively as a human race, here's my 
answer and question back. What would we as a collective conscious Gaia reach out and touch together in the universe? What, instead of thinking as a creator that we are reaching out to a source, what if because of the multiple dimensions of the universe, uh, the multiple universes, what if as a collective consciousness, we were able at one point to share and connect out with those higher consciousnesses? And by higher, I mean, if you want to describe it in simplex terms as uh, world creators, universe creators, what if that wasn't something that was hidden or mysterious to us? What if we did walk, what we, we've reduced to understanding as walking in a garden with God, what if in reality we did collectively connect that in a very peaceful collective, I'm throwing that in there, but what if we did collectively uh, talk and were individually connected to that existence? And what if it's right. not an entity so much as a as a state of being? Right. That that would be my short answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love this too because this is giving uh, myself a lot to think about. And it, again, one of the things again, I'm, and I won't go further with blowing you up on this end, but uh, again, one of the things that I see when I'm listening to you is that you're still compartmentalizing certain aspects. So instead of just moving all about like this, and then you got to make sense of a whole picture we're getting some of this here we understand it we're going here and it, you know it kind of borrows from it. all right so i'll give you the whole uh analysis off camera here but it, this is great dude and there's a reason i'm letting you go the way that you're going because okay it's, good yeah it's, it's, so it's nothing stale in any way <laughs> Inter interrupt anytime you want no that's fine i'm just fascinated and again if uh if i need to i, I will but i i just i love listening to what you're saying here uh brian forrester has recently presented evidence that certain structures and compositions of stone used in ancient egypt have seemingly been exposed to extreme heat or some sort of unnatural reaction people propose everything from alien wars solar flares or another cataclysmic event occurring about twelve thousand years ago uh we covered this a little bit on well third phase of moon had covered yeah. this and then third phase had covered this what are your thoughts on this observation in the way of whatever destruction or uh changes in composition that we see over on these sites uh oh yeah okay so i spent almost four years working on my book and part of that was to develop maps that show hmm. if there's a city off of cuba that looks uh like it's pyramidal in structure likely poly polygonal in walls and it's off the coast of cuba it's 2300 feet deep and by all accounts that i can sort out it couldn't have been above water Ex you know there's a theory of hydroponic plate shifting mm -hmm. that what the waters of the ocean got below the plates of the earth and that's what uh accounts for the massive uh, change in heights and depths of different things around the world however the last time that that city was above water was over 50,000 years ago. It's not like they built it waiting for a flood. And Doggerland in Europe uh, was even 4,000 years ago. There was a significant portion between France and all the way to Scotland. This is all one land. And so remember, everything we are talking about right now is about the land that's above water. And we know, uh, like Graham Hancock's work in the, in the 1990s, him diving off the coast of India, like very far off, and there's like a city there that nobody wants to look at. You have this structure off of Cuba, nobody wants to look at. And so a lot of the engineered soil, archaeological record, we are not remotely at the, we're not, oh yeah, well in the Mediterranean, there's the city of Alexandria. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about dynastic peoples. I'm talking about cymatic, cyclopean, polygonal uh, engineering, not only for waves and frequencies, but scalar waves, you know, terrifying weaponized scalar waves. And the vitrification on what Brian, Brian Forster is just a bulldozer. It's amazing mm -hmm. what that guy, uh, I've, I own quite a few of his books. I've met him a couple of times. There's no way he'll remember me, except maybe a couple of years ago, he'd remember that I exclusively annoyed him to no end with questions <laughs> <laughs> at contact in the desert. Uh, so I was, I was still in the, really in the heart of writing my book. And I'm looking over like, 
Brian Forrester is sitting here and no one's there <laughs> and it's 120 <laughs> degrees. Maybe that's why, because we're at Joshua tree, which is probably why mm -hmm. they moved it indoor to an air conditioned resort in Palm Springs. But I'm sitting with, I'm, I'm like, Brian Forrester's sitting right here. This is a huge deal. <laughs> and I basically asked him like 37 questions for like a half hour. And, uh, <laughs> and anyway, so bro, going to these sites like in Egypt where uh, Ro Dr. Robert Schock and others have proposed, there's a couple different proposals. One is uh, solar flares, that mm -hmm. a massive sun solar flare, i.e. a reason not to own a Tesla unless it does have a gas pedal uh, and, or manual huh. steering. I'm just saying EMP, anyone, anyone yeah. ever think about that? No, it's um, interesting. Huh? I'm, I'm just saying I want I, I want my War of the Worlds Tom Cruise minivan that starts after I pop the clutch. <laughs> you know, that's the vehicle that gets me safe or at least less gooey. And so, that's funny. but here's, here's this uh, vitrification. And the one theory is that a massive solar flare hits two, uh, timely enough, uh, you know, just over a year ago. Well, no, it's been gosh, you no know, time warp right now. A couple of years ago, they find a 19 mile wide diameter crater in Greenland and say, well, this could have happened as early as Younger Dryas, and it could have happened well 65 million years ago. So it's another massive impact that would have created an incredible heat wave. So one of the things I like to point about polygonal construction is that it's built big, not. And again, this is something to, for people to understand: the tools and sciences to measure the earthquakes and frequencies and waves the the tools the ancillary technology to measure that to make the right cuts in the structure that you're going to build and then you're going to put wood on top of that you're going to put if you can cut 1000 ton stones and move them and not just four sided but make them fit perfectly together then you can cut down 60 foot diameter 380 foot tall redwoods you can nobody thinks about that that forests were, were not the scrub trees that we see it's like oh well i have some elms and they're 150 feet tall and they're no 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 think sequoia think meta sequoia mm -hmm. the granddads think redwoods these are trees that a society that can manage cyclopean uh these are foundations we're looking at foundational structures the technology to cut and shape wood would have been stunning mm -hmm. the work i mean if they could cut the stones like that no one ever thinks about the woodwork we've lost you have to watch lord of the rings to kind of sort it out the elves you know but <laughs> not 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 for real you know we we don't have what's left of their outer structures but there's this hideous record that's showing up all over the world of some sort of vitrification a high heat impact a high heat imp uh energy against uh, a stone surface that's either a quartzite rose granite gran any kind of super heavy hard stones and it's showing uh high heat that then of course causes really fast cooling which causes flaking which is vitrification a form of it and i know uh scott walter would get more technical with it because he's the forensic geologist but he's not here to yell at me so this is where i'm starting <laughs> with it and so we have this technology now that where where everyone has a camera and everyone's kind of sorting this stuff out and i think to something you made earlier it's a really good point there are too many this is why it's a renaissance nobody told michelangelo you're going to be a good or a bad well they kind of sorted it out in his lifetime but leonardo da vinci uh nobody told him he could dissect humans if you want to wait for permission uh, Flinders Petrie did an expedition. You know, everybody considers him one of the great Egyptologists. There is Arturo, Arthur Pazansky, wrote books on Tiwanaku. Here's a guy they call, they, you know, it, you know, they they gave him a nickname. He just wanted to go be an adventurer. The people who are out there that are going to explore, I would say, have never stopped. The people who want uh, to scratch each other's back and just sit behind a desk and just do peer-reviewed articles and kind of stick with it you 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 need to bring in some uh collective sciences like geologists you don't you know you don't bring in a cultural expert for a society who who is the cultural expert to gobekli tepe when they thought it never existed ever <laughs> and now we have experts that well we know no you didn't you thought they were all running around trying to nail you know like nail deer with some spears and some bows and arrows <laughs> and 
And now here's a whole megalithic. Well, clearly, let's roll out the playbook. Yeah, let me guess. It was a fertility goddess. It was a temple. It was, I'm not mm -hmm. going to go down mm -hmm. that road. Let's stick yep. with vitrification. So these giant cyclopean statues obliterated. Definitely as if a wall of heat came across and they were hit from one side. However, uh, a, a pylon type device weapon that like a slug that's launched from space, a uh, super terrifying idea, like an impact, uh, kind of like uh, the device that, you know, they hit the cows with to hit them right in the temple in the mm -hmm. forehead. It's just air powered sort of deal, but something like that to create a shockwave, but scalar weapons. So we're straight up in the world of Tesla and the idea that, uh, a society that could measure and manage frequencies could create weapons. And I would say that militarily that the structures we're seeing, we don't actually know their original purposes. I'm not saying they were exclusively ancient military, but someone should consider that not only were they managing against earthquakes and assorted other disasters, I would think that right down to the soil, that if they were able to be so sensitive to what's going on in the air itself and they understood genes, genomes, that means that means biology. That means very frankly managing meta seismic metastructures, which are everything from nano-sized crystals to larger objects that would go under the foundation of a building. Mm -hmm. And that's something I'm really into. We can talk about that later. But this this means that I would design a building to not only withstand, but be prepared, but not in the sense of radar ways. But if you were going to set, if you're going to hit a building with a scalar weapon, there's a possibility that right down to the engineered soil would be able to send a current of information or through sound that there would be a field perturbation that could move faster than the scalar wave and that they would design and build against these kind of weaponized attacks. So nobody's off in that one. You're building Cyclopean because hey, everybody down in the laser cut, rock cut uh, uh, storage centers and underground tunnels, everybody down under the ground, we're about to get hit. Uh, we get hit by something natural. They still can't control all of it. And you come out and the pyramid system is flooded. The uh, Machu Picchu's not. Tiwanaku is okay. Uh, you have lots of places around the world that need to be swept up and broomed up. And at this point, for all those that also argue the world of geopolymers, Dr. Joseph David Ovitz invented geopolymers. Uh, he still runs the Geopolymer Institute. And there was work done on the Great Pyramid where uh, this is what something, this is how our dynastic education screws with us. People are like, well, do you think the pyramid was built with geopolymers or all these two, you know, six million blocks removed in 26 years, 28 years? And that's not possible. But then they're like, well, what if they poured it? No, 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 no. Hold on. If you're going to get hit by a scalar weapon and get vitrified on one side or the machine itself blows up because there's no way it was a tomb, we're, we're all over it. But uh, <laughs> I know, right? And, yeah. and, and I just like, let's spend no time on that anymore. Let's, okay. But there is uh geopolymers but people are like but they're not all geopolymers yeah because you're a highly ancient advanced human society that has lived for hundreds of thousands tens of thousands or worse more uncomfortably millions of years and you live through terrible crap where sometimes you can't stop it you prepare for it but when you come out and all your wood and your metal and some of your other structures some of them make it some of them don't these giant cyclopean main energy machines and your your infrastructure the uh you know like the uh the obelisks are they're still all standing but and they're still functioning you have less to repair that's one thing then there's the weaponized side and then what you have is vitrification that says well at one time possibly multiple times Physical, natural, and or weaponized disaster impacted these different cities. Mm -hmm. What's the total telltale? Well, I would say the millions of square kilometers that are underwater and not just paleo or uh, Gobekli type cities, but I'm talking those were adapted cities. And so we have to have joint sciences all together look and say, yeah, this culture definitely grabbed that megalithic piece and decided to stand it up in a field and voila you have standing stones <laughs> and then another culture came along when those standing stones were really weathered and old and went 
well, this must be sacred and holy. So we'll make them. And then they find a quarry and they add on. But then when you find the quarry, you say, well, that's the original quarry. No, that's the quarry that was used by the adapted dynastic people that took that area over and maintained or added on to these existing dolmens, these existing remnants of this ancient mm -hmm. high-tech past. And now there's even video that I love that uh, oh gosh, I'm blanking. I can't. I'm so sorry because I'm a uh, ancient architects. I can't believe I blanked on his channel. Uh, <laughs> I I love that guy. Um, uh, I've never met him, but I I he just did a video, and I got to give him credit because I think we, you and I, this dialogue, what we're doing, we're having a better conversation for people to get it out in the vernacular and for in people's mindsets to just try self experimentation to learn but to not rely on academic, not to disbelieve academic sources, but this world is ours. You don't need permission to go explore it or climb it or dig it. Well, in a sense, I'm being metaphorical, but the mm -hmm. point is to not deny yourself or wait for some external human being to tell you that you may now have a curiosity about this. That's just silly. So uh, that, that, that being said, uh, I've totally forgotten where I was going. You got it. <laughs> That's okay, because you know what? It's about that time for the uh, the big question here. And as short as this actually is, it, it's going to pack a punch. And uh, believe me, I understand this is a general question. And, you know, do do your best with this, okay? But I, I think that you would have some real insight on, on this here. Uh, in your opinion, what is our true origin? Have we identified the missing link in any convincing respect? Uh, the Klerkstorp spheres are the oldest man-made object or, or you know, not natural object on Earth. They are not natural concretions. That is uncomfortable. That that we're we're so we're asking what does the Earth and what was going on two and a half to three and a half billion years ago? That there is thousands of these uh, croquet ball-looking objects. So like, was it a old driving range and it had become sedimentary and abandoned and so we're talking about human occupation almost back to the beginnings of the planet mm -hmm. and you, well i mean do you subscribe to the idea that we may have been created by extraterrestrial races without me i'm without me going into the the whole theory here guys yeah, that's uh, something that is the it, that is literally the one of the heart uh, premise and the subject that I'm very dear to because it is easier to assume that foreign entities, interdimensional beings, you name it, fill in the blank, anybody rather than us built everything around us that we all showed up on this planet because of a foreign intervention, not because very early on. So here's the exciting part. Did we come here from somewhere else? possible right but have we have we completely ignored the factual existence of way more advanced constructions on earth and have we had the arrogance hubris or the terror to not admit that oh my god we were way further ahead than we are now we were definitely more conscious we were definitely more esoteric. We were definitely more, not in a metaphysical way. We were literally more connected. We understood more. We connected more. And I think there were spurts of it. Like a lot of people don't know about Sufis and collective dreaming. And that's a whole nother subject. But imagine being with 35 super uh, conscious Sufis that are literally having 35 person collective dream states. And that Jeez. that's like, you know, people think, oh, that's neat. That's weird. That's unique. That's a one-off. <laughs> and so people get uncomfortable with that. And so now it's like, oh, yeah, definitely uh, there was interdimensional space traveling people because, well, we didn't do this. Like what? They were just like, okay, look, we're not going to make gunpowder or give them lasers again, but we'll help them build this really big tomb called the pyramid. I, I just, I, I can't, I can't. It's just... It, it's an easier jump. We have come up with the whole hundredth monkey theory was fascinating to me. 
the, it was why do monkeys on Madagascar basically do what's on mainland Africa? And why, do, why can they use sticks and anthills as tools? And the theory developed that, well, one monkey taught one monkey, one monkey figured it out, kind of figured out what a stick was, then figured out how to stick it in the hole. The other one figured out how to eat with it, then taught another one, taught another one. And eventually the hundredth monkey was born and grew up and just knew how to use it, which I quite frankly think is accurate when you look at any barely two-year-old and a DVD player. That's but also terrifying. they were talking about, you know, this influence going over a distance. So uh, monkeys that were confined to one yeah. island were taught this behavior. After some yeah. time, the other island, you know, far yonder, uh, yep. they were experienced the exact same thing. They were exhibiting the same behavior. Yeah. Yeah. So like Madagascar and uh, they weren't swimming out to Madagascar was the right. theory, right? <laughs> and, uh, there was no like boating monkeys, although... There, the other theory goes that you could stick a thousand monkeys in a room and give them typewriters, and eventually, statistically, one of them would pump out a, a great American novel. You <laughs> yeah, know, there's, <laughs> that, yeah, so there's that, right? So, so it's an easier conversation. We could talk forever. People would be totally fine and chiming in on, oh, yeah, I think, uh, and here's why, because people have seen UFOs. People mm -hmm. have had personal experiences. People have had visions. People have had things. And they're like, well, I know it's a UFO. Why? Well, because they don't look like me. They don't look like you. Because why? Because if you're going to do zero point turns on a Mach 30, uh, totally avoid the fastest technology and anything we have today, you don't think that having skin that can see infrared and being shorter and gray and tripping out your eyeballs to do the onboard weapon skills. And meanwhile, your scalar connecting with another society and your scout ship and your IE friends that are all vacating around Pluto. You know, you're, you're, you're talking about humans that have been here for tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years that end up in a smaller community that have to rebuild. But think of it as a cruise ship. They have to rebuild with not everyone who knew how to do a foundry, let alone knew how to make metal. Yet you've got a guy who knows how to program computers. Well, what mm. use is that guy if you don't have the right medical technology? And so you're, you're looking at a collective group that may have not have been complete during the last disaster. And I think the last disaster that really hurt them was the one that put that Cuban city and others like it that we have not found at that depth. I think that's the last time they got hit in a worldwide way. And then I think post that there was catastrophe and we could get into all of it. But when it comes to, we need to table, this is the worst thing for everyone at listening. We need to table through all of our eyes and ears, the facts that we are finding in the ground, not to prove out ir irrelevant. There's always simple people there. And by simple, I mean, living with the earth, they are in loincloths. They're always making fires the natural way. They'll be fine if your big box retailer does not exist. They will be fine with no mortgage payments. They will be fine literally with a knapsack about this big with literally nothing in it almost. And But the essentials, it's crazy what we think are essentials. But mm. we don't, we can't table who made us. And I don't mean we can't ask the question. We need to ask the question, but then we need to admit that we are so blindly uh, reaching out for that answer that we've literally ignored this massive ancient lost worldwide population. And I mentioned it earlier, engineered soil. I bring it up because Terra Preta, the identical formula that's found in Brazil to the tune of an area twice the size of Spain. That's just their current estimates. But it's in Central America. It's in North America. It's, well, in the sense that it's called other kind of biochars. But Terra Preta that's in Brazil is in North Africa and Australia at least 7,000 years ago. The identical formulas. What is Australia? And South Africa, South America, and North Africa have in common over 7,000 years ago. Oh, wait, we weren't supposed to be there together in a group, collectively making really advanced soil. So if it's a reuse issue by cultures post Younger Dryas that are using it, what we know then is that a very advanced human population, just like in the 100 years that we can now 3D print and clone animals, we're talking about a society that can very much develop technology that is mental, that connects mm -hmm. with external technology like flying machines. Mm -hmm. Would it be easy for them to hide on this planet? Yeah, very easy. We can't even keep track of a super colony of penguins in the Danger Islands in Antarctica. Literally. Hey, news, everybody. We found 1.5 million hiding penguins. <laughs> and 
<laughs> and you know, we don't notice penguins. And I've brought that up before, but it's a good example. We're not at 10 to 15% conscious, very observant. So this isn't poo-poo on us. It's how do we table a question about who made us when we still think we have junk gene genes, yet there are so many people out mm, there okay. having those paranormal, having those. I know I was used, I, I I feel like I was this person in my past, but was I that person or am I expressing enough consciousness of my internal super, what we're going to call now superhuman abilities. I'm actually connecting. I'm downloading. I'm connecting to that aura that's around me. That is real. That is connected to this collective human consciousness. And I'm able to connect and wire directly. Is it because I also share some, physical genetic memory with that lineage and i'm part of the direct uh download for that person to remanifest and 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 what does that really look like there are too many people having too many experiences with these other things like whim and steeg and and these uh, movement cultures where we're like wow the average human being is becoming a decathlete and with like 90 days of training and <laughs> and it's not just to wow at the olympics we are uh, mentally uh, creating meditative levels that aren't just, I used to drive me nuts going to, I like yoga. Don't get me wrong. I do. But going in and where they're like, okay, whatever your problem was at the door, leave it there. It's, um, and I'm like, I still hate that asshole that cut me off on the freeway. And, and I'm not going to let it go. And, and, you know, when I do something like Wim Hof, there's no, I don't have to think about anything. There's no thinking a switch goes and I am somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And that, like up for another dialogue, I guess. Fantastic, man. Uh, you know, again, the, you know, you, you brought up a different perspective and I, I really like the question there, you know, how can we entertain understanding our origins at 10 to 15% consciousness when we're still debating these genes that we call junk? Uh, there's so much yeah. more that we, we need to learn and understand. And of course, it's all part of the process too, which yeah. is really uh, a, a fun and, and enjoyable discovery as we yeah. go along. I think it's part of our human experience. Um, so we have about 20 minutes left and I have more questions than we have time for, but I'm going to bring up some of the ones that really kind of uh, jumped out at me when I, I started working on these. Uh, it's long been speculated that our ancient ancestors, the remnants of Lemuria and Atlantis, at least uh, sought refuge within the, the planet at a given time. What are your thoughts on the possibilities of full civilizations existing beneath our earth's crust? Admirable Admiral Byrd's story has always been so fascinating to me. Yeah. Um, I think I just, man, I was wondering who we were just talking to that, uh, said that they know somebody who had actually made the trip to that area to try to, I mean, mm -hmm. this is what's so frustrating about this. There is more than enough. Everyone listening is six degrees uh, not even six. I bet they're one degree within the margin of knowing, uh, somebody with enough capital to, be able to get the permits to go to South Africa, so with or South Antarctica, to mm. to to leave and go and explore and revisit. Now, here's the issue with that: of the people that have gone that have had issues, the issue was to get to the cave, to get to where it's described. Uh, it's allowed by land, but that is an arduous, like grab the sled dogs, multi thousand mile. By the way, there's the other thing. Dogs aren't, birds are not that much better than us, but do you see any of them in Patagonia where? <laughs> I mean, oh, they have fur. Okay. It's 30 below zero. You, you sort that out with just fur, you know, <laughs> but there, there's some of your uh, collective, you know, there's some of your Wim Hof stuff, but mm -hmm. so everyone's within a degree of knowing somebody that could plan an expedition. It's this simple. We don't have to keep questioning this. We know where it is. We have Admiral Byrd's account. Uh, were there, was it a secret Nazi base? Was there an actual fight? Was there four to 6,000 soldiers actually going toe to toe with Victor Schauberger, the naturalist, uh, quantum mechanic, you know, is it, were they flying around in anti-gravity saucers? And I mean, really war of the worlds, Nosferatu killing each other for at least a day or two, you know, with, yeah, good, take this Nazi. See, yeah. yeah. And then, <laughs> And then, yeah. And then, you know, then they all went, yeah. So, yeah, there's going to be aliens, see? And we're all going to ride dinosaurs with them. Yeah. Right, right down here. Yeah. They all saddled. Yeah. Bang. And then, 
you know, get some 1940s pomade and get down there with your, uh, yeah, sorry, I digress into a canvas that. No, it's okay. No see, we always have to have those pop culture references. See, well, maybe you don't yeah. see, see, but you should see. See, see? Oh, it's just the <laughs> bees needs. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> sorry. So <laughs> have you heard about the Charleston? It's going to be big. I sure it is. <laughs> and so we are dating ourselves because no one young watches any of this stuff. That's yeah. Anyway, back to the twenties and thirties. So although it was just Christmas and I'm sure people watched, uh, it's a wonderful life and they do dance the Charleston. But so Admiral Byrd uh, heads down to Antarctica and we have his diary and assuming all is well with the diary and that it's accurate. We have this account and of, you know, everything from Nazi, uh, you know, German socialist period, 1940s, don't get banned on YouTube conversation. Uh, socialists, uh, they, have flying saucers and or have established a base post World War II, and we send a expeditionary force there. There were reported injuries, but it wasn't from frostbite that there was conflict, right? And then Admiral Byrd's assessment of a second sun or a bright light again, let's go check it out. So, here's what I can tell you right now for everyone listening. There is zero restrictions by land to go to that cave. Zero restrictions. You can't fly to it. So follow that. It's a no fly hmm. zone. And you have to want to be really cold, which I guess I'm willing to. So I might be putting my foot in it if somebody calls up with the money. But we are yeah, perfectly capable. You, you and I and a small group are perfectly capable. Uh, and I don't think it's completely an unaffordable expense. But on a sponsored expedition, we are very capable of getting off this thing tonight and calling out one of hopefully a zillion listeners and say, look, Admiral Byrd wrote this, that there is an entrance to an underground world. It is the mm -hmm. basis for Jules Verne and or, you know, because there was other there was another assessment of that uh, from a sailor from a uh, hundred something years earlier. So we have this assessment that we have warm waters and lakes that we have an underground world that it's accessible and that location is known. We have to go, we have to establish camp. We have to be able to trek uh, arduously, but in proper equipment across, I'm not sure if it's more than a thousand miles, but we have to trek to the location we could check it out and we could leave, but can we fly a drone there? Can we fly a plane there? That's not allowed. So the barrier to entry to answer this question, I call BS. I'm asking right now, first time I've ever done this, but I'm throwing it out there. I'm planning to, uh, right now, I'm planning two archaeological endeavors right now. One's in America and one's out of country, but due to the current circumstances and until I have more established, I wouldn't talk further about what's being planned other than it has to do with ancient engineered soil. We don't have our eyes on that because when you talk about genes, I want to remind everybody, I'm not just talking about our genes. I'm talking about why is it that no academic institution, ask yourselves right now, ask everyone, you know, ask anyone and everyone associated with every university. Why aren't you testing the Paracas? They are born with their elongated skulls. Mm -hmm. Why with why, if you have anything to do with ancient biology, why the hell aren't you testing mummies that we know are at least 9,000 years old? So question. that's one thing, but we have the ability to go to Antarctica and you and me and everybody keep, we, we know the stories and yeah, we could, we could paint a prettier picture other than Charleston tapping Tommy gun carrying, you know, big baller fight out down there. But for us to, not table a discussion about what does an expedition back to that entrance look like is silly at this point. It's like, okay, great. Um, look I know at some there, of the sorry. Oh, go I, ahead. I was yeah. going to say, I know there are many variables it, to consider when undertaking an expedition like that. And I believe that there have been some people who have at least made the attempt to do that. Um, I think some of their plans may have been truncated within the planning stages. Uh, and I'm not exactly certain that some of these parties have actually gone off and, and trekked up that way. But I know that it's been talked about for quite some time, at least uh, in our circles, to do something like that. Um, just for the sake of time, I'm going to move on to this last one here because I could talk with you about that a, a lot more than we are, obviously. But here, here I want to propose something to you. Do you think that there will ever be any public archaeological excursions 
to our nearest celestial bodies because we're seeing wow. all these figures on Mars and we see, uh, you know, different structures, even on the moon. We're calling it pareidolia. We're calling it uh, apophia. Uh, all these different things that it just don't lead to there actually being something there. And yet when we're looking at it, there are so many of us who are convinced. Do you think we'll ever get the chance to, again, publicly know about any expeditions going out and uh, resurfacing some of that history on our, our closest planets? Yeah, it's so frustrating and also exciting to speculate. Is the military already doing archaeological expeditions? Uh, I think that that's a fact. That It's a natural fact. If you're on the planet now, there is archaeological groups associated with military uh, all militaries uh, they dig a bunker and they end up uh, uncovering ancient advanced technology mm -hmm. and or uh, ruins or giant rock cut uh, tunneled or I mean they're, they're, this, these systems exist Eric Von Danigan and Buzz Aldrin went to explore it well known super popular you know happened in the 70s you know whatever uh, but I think that these modern governments, especially since World War II, have been way more involved in whatever, if you want to rack it up to clandestine gray state stuff, that there that there is a, uh, I think, a great race as far as knowing that it's here. But also then, if they reach those levels of development, we have to think, like we've all heard of maybe some people, the Black Knight satellite you know, the way it orbits from pole to pole and that it's at a height that other satellites aren't. And again, it's a rock structure. And uh, there are a lot of different things about the Black Knight satellite that you think, oh, that's interesting. Maybe it's from somewhere else. No, maybe it's ancient cable vision. And hmm. and we, we always think it, it could be. Now, my publisher, Olaf Phillips from Paranormal Paranormal Press, Paranoia Press, they, uh, you know, he thinks it's an ex a spent weapon system. And I, I'm not opposed to that theory at all. I think it's a pretty brilliant one. But we have to think in terms of if we've already been here and they've been further, what do their satellites, what do their space stations, what do their interplanetary uh, uh, voyagers look like? What do mm -hmm. their moon rovers look like? And then if they did get there, what do those ruins look like? So are we going to do it? Have we already started? I'd like to speculate that not only are they well aware of it here on the planet and they have first dibs and that's how it's been. I think they have maybe gotten off world with it because they're trying to get ahead of themselves. But at the same time, I think there's stuff as simple as ancient space, ancient space junk that's floating around this orbit that mm -hmm. has not burned up. And then on other planets, like these mystery FM signals that were just discovered, or, there's always something, but the assumption is always that it's foreign or that it's come here. It's it, it's so much easier to think that. It's sickening to think that we possibly achieved it and fell so far as to not even remember. Mm. And that's what dolmens and standing stones and the ancient polygonal ruins and the, and, and the weathering around the Sphinx and so many other ruins and what's underwater indicates. So if we get off this planet commercially and can get on the moon, the first day you and I pick up a moon rock, the first day that that happens is the first day that someone's doing archaeological work in public. And it'll happen because no matter what, they're not going to stop us. Like if we get to the moon and then it's like, okay, well, you can go out in a moon rover, but you can't go over that hill. You know, <laughs> somebody's mm, always yeah, going to want to go yeah. over the hill, right? So there'll be... There'll be the Area 51s. That's the thing. It's like, well, you know, we have a military base. Yeah, why is it always conveniently located around something that was probably a well-established ancient structure that no one ever thinks about that? They think, well, you know, they build bases strategically based on where they want to launch missiles and and how to not be hit. Uh, does it ever occur to anyone that they also build bases in areas that they don't want the general public exploring or for the paradigm, which... It might as well, right? It might as well be a house of cards that's crashed, burned, burned up, and it's smoldering ash, and it's turning to like sediment. So I, it's exciting to think that we could be on another planet doing. Because I feel it would be really frustrating and embarrassing to hit Mars or to hit a moon or the moon, the moon or a moon of Mars, and literally look at the ruins of a polygonal climatic system, wall system that looks just like a half wall on Easter Island or Angkor Wat or Keystone Cuts and go, oh God, we were everywhere. That's you know, going to. 
that's yeah, fascinating. No, it really is fascinating to look at that. And of course, I, I advocate as much as I can to explore the terrain that you have first. Um, right. You know, but if if space exploration and archaeological work outside of our you know terrestrial body is something that's offered to us you know i don't see why anybody wouldn't jump at the opportunity my question well not question but my concern more or less is that you know when we're looking at humanity and some of those who have the ability to travel out there and let's be honest those who are there the only ones who are really going to know the answers to any questions that could be proposed about where they go um there's this sort of parent um tier if you will and I'm, I'm having trouble explaining this but there's like a parental tier where there are, are a handful of people who are standing there maybe in their minds thinking that they're protecting us and not you know the way that a parent protects a child not letting them know every detail of the world that they will eventually find on their own <clears throat> but i have to believe that there has to be a more nefarious intention in respect to i'm on top of a, a pedestal but i'm so high up that you can't see me and i know yeah. much more than you ever will in fact you will never know that i'm sitting on this pedestal i'll just yeah. be there and so that's a big concern for me but you know we're gonna have to see where things go i know elon musk has his plans and of course uh there there are others who have purported you know different designs that they want to look into in terms of that structure moving forward in our uh, space exploration and perhaps the archaeology that that goes in but uh we're, we're getting short on time here jared as much fun as i'm having with you i want to give you the opportunity to just tell us a little bit about your show and where we can find you i know yes you are on conflict radio which is also a fantastic show uh but where where else can we find you and your work and i'm going to cite the name of your book again before we close out Sure. So I'll skip the book citing, except that if you can get it on Amazon, but if you want it signed, I actually do sign them for each of you. And I go to the post office and mail them, which might be a little archaic, but if you go to notaliens.com, I will, if you don't want to, right now I'm running a deal. I, I have a private membership area, which includes a lot of research and a lot of photos from my trips to South Africa and my work there. And then, um, of course, exclusive photos from the book and then uh, my own interviews. I do all that work there. So you can get a book, you can get it shipped to you. You can have a membership for six months or a year. Right now I'm, I'm giving away two books for a year and it, it works out to basically your small iced espresso, not so much your Breve latte cost. So it's about two sixty five a month after you're done getting the book. So please join me there if you'd like. And then, um, I am actually doing a virtual conference in April for Forbidden Knowledge News. I'll be on that virtual conference uh, April 2nd. Um, and I'll be, um, I, I, I really like, I was, I, was, I was talking to them last night. Uh, conflict is coming up and we have a show, I think, uh, coming up Monday. So there's definitely, uh, on my front page of my website, Not Aliens, there's, I will always have a link here for your show. And for uh, all the shows I've done that are just public, you can go to my main page if you just want to snoop around and then go link off to one of these great podcasts that's available also. Fantastic, man. And uh, again, thank you so much for being with us tonight on Dark Hour Paranormal. I guarantee I've been watching the chat uh, out of the, the peripherals here and everybody's really been enjoying the show. There are some questions that I'm sorry I didn't get to. And, uh, you know, one of our members here, I even told him that I'll, I'll provide him with some uh, content after the show in the ways because, you know, we again, it's a time constraint thing. But you know what? Yeah, I, I like to kind of put it in. uh not compartmentalize it, but, you know, sort of make this a pretty package so that once you get into it, you know, you start eating that apple. And by the time you get down to the bottom, you're not hungry yet for the other apple. You're still contemplating and digesting what's been talked about. And you eventually will get hungry again. So, you know, oh, yeah. I think that's important to do uh, when we we approach certain subjects. But this has been fascinating, dude. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I really appreciate it. We'll, we'll, we'll cut up apples. We'll eventually make a pie and then we'll overfeed people. <laughs> I like the plan. That's perfect. Guys, get ready. Open your mouths. Okay. No odd puns yeah, intended here. Come okay. Choo -choo. No inferences. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I'm going to take you off for a moment. I'll say my proper goodbyes off camera. So hang right. tight if you can. And yep. I'll close out the show very quickly. Thanks again, Jared. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for listening. Oh, another fantastic show. Yeah, I know this, this doesn't look exactly the way it's supposed to be a lot wider, but you know what? We'll get there, right? Uh, I got to change a few things over the next month or so for the best reasons. Uh, thank you guys for being here. I've watched all of you in the chat tonight. I'm sorry that I didn't get to all of your questions or even some of them. Uh, once I'm, 
once we get into a conversation and it starts rolling, there's a lot of different factors that go into, you know, how, how things are orchestrated and where the conversation goes and so forth. So I know I don't need to explain this to you guys. Most of you have been here for quite some time and I appreciate all of your support. We've been growing at an incredibly rapid pace over here. Uh, please guys, right now it is 1036 over here on the Eastern coast and rich from Gufan is uh, live, man. I almost said Gufan radio stream. Jesus. So Richard Giordano from Gufan is over there now. He's live. Go and check out his show. He'll be on until 12 o'clock uh, Eastern time. And then I believe third phase of moon will be releasing something later on this evening. If uh, now nah, there's no if that's that's more than likely what's happening. So keep your uh, eyes out for that. And thank you again for being here. If you guys want to donate to Dark Hour Paranormal, you may. There's a link in the description for PayPal. Uh, if if I got nothing else, if no. Anyway, so go out and check out these guys. <laughs> I'm losing. I'm just trying to wipe the gray matter out of my ears. It's sort of dripping. It's a little bit here on the nose, too. Sorry. I mean, you know, conversations like that really get you going. And uh, I'll be honest with you. I'm still sitting in that energy, that intellectual bubble. And I'm, again, digesting uh, everything we've just gone over. So, okay. Thank you very much, guys. Have a wonderful rest of your night. Will we... We will be back on Friday with Mogion Monster. I think I got it right. Mogion Monster. I'm saying it again just to make sure. Because if I got it right, that's that's two wins. If I got it wrong, then, well, we'll just revisit the drawing boards. So Mogion Monster will be here at 8 o'clock Eastern Time on Friday night. We're going to have a fantastic discussion. He's a great host. Go and check out his channel, Mogion Monster. Uh, and you can see he's in the chat right now if you need to know how to spell it. Go and check it out. All right, guys. Thank you so much. I know I'm forgetting something. Oh, hit like and subscribe and all those fantastic things to support the channel. We appreciate you here. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. Stay magical. Stay inquisitive. And stay on top of things, eh? Yeah? See? Staying on top of things. That's what you got to do. Especially in this field. Not literally. I meant figuratively. Get off. All right. Here we go, guys. <laughs> Have a good rest of your night. We'll see you next time.